Welcome to this presentation from the Wisconsin First Detector Network. This video was adapted from a Wisconsin First Detector Network training session. In this video, you'll hear Paul Skowinski from UW Extension Lakes Program talk about Eurasian water milfoil. We'll start just talking about Eurasian milfoil because this is one that a lot of people are familiar with or have heard of in the past. This is a species that arrived uh, in Wisconsin in the 1960s. It's been in the U.S. for many decades before that. But it was imported throughout much of the world as an ornamental aquarium plant. And eventually, somebody had the grand idea of releasing it into a local waterway. And now we have uh, 700 and some locations in Wisconsin alone that contain this plant. And it costs an incredible amount of money every year to the state and to lake associations battling this thing. There are seven native water milfoils in Wisconsin, and then there's just one exotic, the Eurasian. So it's important to recognize that if you're trying to detect early populations of Eurasian milfoil to know that there are other water milfoils around that are, are native, that belong here, and they look fairly similar. One of the easy characteristics to notice in the early summer to midsummer period is that the Eurasian milfoil tends to have a, a darker green to often reddish color near the top, and the native species tend to be pretty much just a straight bright green color. From this shot, I was delighted to see these two growing right next to each other for this photo opportunity, but it also really illustrates well how quickly the Eurasian milfoil grows to the surface and how densely it grows near the surface. You can see the northern milfoil on the left. Most of it has not reached the surface yet. It's growing fairly sparse. There's plenty of room for fish to move between the plants. But then on the Eurasian milfoil on the right, it's already at the surface. There's already a few flowers poking up in the center of that clump. And it's just profusely branching near the surface, creating an extremely dense stand. Looking at an individual plant, this is what it would look like. All the water milfoils belong to the genus Myriophyllum. That means many leaves. And it refers to all the leaf divisions on each leaf. The leaves are always going to be in whorls of four or more than four, up to six. A whorl just means that there's more than two leaves at any given point on the stem. So it could be a whorl of three, four, five, six, or, or whatever. Generally, they're always in fours, but I have seen them up to six. The other characteristic to look for is how many pairs of leaflet divisions there are on a single leaf. So you'd break one leaf off of the stem, and you'd see this very feathery appearance. So you'd want to count up one side. Since you're counting pairs, you don't have to count all of them. You only have to count half, so either the bottom or the top. And you'll get at least 12, generally much more than 12. A typical pure Eurasian milfoil will usually have 16, 17, or more pairs of leaflets. There is also the unfortunate reality of hybrid water milfoils in Wisconsin. The Eurasian milfoil has taken it upon itself to hybridize with uh, at least the northern water milfoil, if not in other species, and create a very highly variable hybrid that sometimes can have exactly 12 pairs of leaflets. It can actually have fewer than 12, but it'll show some characteristics of a native species and some characteristics of an, the invasive Eurasian. And so they're very difficult to identify. The only way that the Wisconsin DNR will accept a new report of a hybrid water milfoil as a, a, a confirmed report is if the DNA has been sampled from that population and is indicative of a hybrid population, because they are so extremely difficult to tell just based on the morphology of the plant. Again, looking at the northern water milfoil here, the, the native milfoils tend to have far fewer than 12 pairs of leaflets per leaf. They also tend to have a slight curve on each leaflet compared to the, the relatively straight leaflets of the Eurasian milfoil. Putting a northern milfoil side by side with a Eurasian out of the water, you can see that the Eurasian milfoil on top collapses readily out of water, so the leaves tend to collapse right onto the stem and onto each other whereas the northern milfoil and most of the common native milfoils tend to hold their shape quite well out of the water also. So where's the best place to look for this? Boat trailers are by far the best place to look for it. Tim mentioned a little bit about uh, waterfowl transporting these things, and he mentioned how we've looked at many undeveloped lakes where there is no public access or at least no boat landing. And we don't find any of these invasive plants in those situations. We'll occasionally find 
a banded mystery snail or something like that where they probably can survive going through the digestive tract of a, a waterfall but we don't see invasive plants showing up in these lakes. So it's very unlikely that they're spreading by waterfowl. The seeds of Eurasian water milfoil have very low viability, and seedlings are almost never observed in the field. It's primarily reproducing itself by fragmentation. And as a fragment of milfoil gets caught on a boat trailer or other equipment and is then put into another lake, that fragment thing can just grow roots from anywhere on the stem where there's a leaf attached to the stem, and it can start a new plant from that. So this is just a, a quick illustration of how the Eurasian milfoil tends to spread. It typically grows to the surface and continues growing horizontally under the surface. Most of our native plants grow to the surface and then flower above water. They're often wind pollinated or insect pollinated, so they do have to reach above the surface in order to contact, uh, have contact with those pollinators or with the wind. But the Eurasian milfoil will often just grow horizontally under the surface, creating these very densely woven mats under the surface. If you have a, a boat or other source of turbulence on the surface, it'll often break this plant into many pieces. They can settle out wherever they happen to settle. And as long as they land somewhere where there's adequate light, they will be able to grow into new plants at that location. So if you can imagine these plants all doing the same thing, getting fragmented into several more pieces, you can see how quickly this, the population can spread around. I've seen it a couple of times in private ponds also, but as I've been talking with the landowners, in both cases, they admitted to me that they had stocked the pond themselves, sort of a midnight stocking as we call it, where somebody just goes down to the Wisconsin River or somewhere else and catches a few fish and put them in their, puts them in their cooler and dumps them in the pond later. And so both times the, the landowner admitted that they did take some water and some fish from a natural water body and transport them to their pond. So it's fairly likely that fragments of the Eurasian milfoil were in that, that water as they transported it. So this is what the fragments look like. This is the top of the milfoil plant. You can see on the, on the left side is the, the bushy top, the growing tip of the plant. And you've got maybe a seven or eight inch fragment here that could have gotten broken off by a fish, a turtle, a wave, a boat prop, uh, who knows, any, any number of possibilities. But you can see these little roots coming out. They're called adventitious roots, which means that it's just forming a root somewhere other than the bottom of the plant where it normally would be. And those can form anywhere where you have a leaf attaching to the stem. So this fragment would just float around uh, either into shallow water where those roots can dangle down and touch the sediment, or eventually the, the fragment could sink. And then those roots would be able to find some sediment to establish themselves in. So with that, uh, there's my contact information. If you want to email me photographs of anything, I certainly welcome that. Um, or give me a call if you have other questions. Thanks for watching this video from the Wisconsin First Detector Network. To learn about our network or to access additional information about invasive species in Wisconsin, please visit our website or contact us.